4. K-278 Even when nuclear submarines have sunk, they can still pose a danger unlike any other. This is certainly the case when it comes to the Soviet nuclear submarine Komsomolets, otherwise known as K-278. Komsomolets sank following a fire in the Norwegian Sea in 1989. 42 lives were lost during the sinking of the submarine, and two plutonium warheads went down with it as well. In 2019, 30 years later, Norwegian scientists sent a remotely operated vehicle ROV, down to survey the wreck which is located at a depth of 5,512 feet. The footage from the survey showed that the Komsomolets was in pretty bad condition. Not only that, but perhaps the scariest thing of all was that the radiation readings coming from the sunken submarine were astronomical, a whopping 800,000 times higher than normal. However, the scientists in charge of the study maintain that there's no cause for alarm. Radiation level is high, but the sheer amount of Arctic water that the submarine resides in is enough to sufficiently dilute the radiation, to a point where it's not causing considerable damage to the water and the sea's ecosystem. One of the things that did catch the scientists by surprise, though, was the presence of a cloud billowing out of one of the submarine's ducts. And when they measured the radiation at the site, it was far higher than normal. The scientists are unsure what exactly is coming out of the duct, but they hope to find out in the near future by conducting further studies on the submarine. 3. USS Thresher the USS Thresher was the first nuclear submarine ever constructed. The sub launched in 1961 from Portsmouth in Maine, where she'd been built to undergo testing. This submarine was pretty special, as it was the first of its kind, a nuclear-powered vessel that had features of both an attack submarine and a specialized hunter-killer craft. Its unique design, with a cigar-shaped hull inspired by the research submarine Albacore, allowed for excellent underwater performance. What made it even more impressive was its top-of-the-line BQQ-2 sonar system, which was considered the most advanced sonar system ever seen on a submarine. With this sonar, it could detect underwater activity from incredibly long distances. The sonar dome itself was no joke either, measuring 15 feet in diameter and housing a whopping 1,241 transducers. Powered with an S5W reactor, the Thresher had practically unlimited range and could dive to a record 1,300 feet, the deepest of any U.S. vessel at the time, thanks to its HY-80 steel hull. The tests of the USS Thresher were carried out with safe hands. At the helm was Vice Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, head of the Navy's nuclear propulsion program. And after successful testing with only a few issues with her instrumentation, Rescher was officially commissioned in August 1961, with Commander Dean L. Axon as her commander. Although she was now in service, Thresher still underwent various tests with her new crew and commander, taking part in some exercises off the Atlantic coast, sailing down all the way to Puerto Rico. But when they docked in San Juan, the crew ran into some trouble with her diesel generator. And to top it off, they had a tough time getting her nuclear reactor up and running again. Following these training trips across long distances came the shock testing of the USS Thresher. The submarine was subjected to heavy assault, more than any other vessel in U.S. Navy history. But in spite of this, she held up well, suffering only minor damage, with most of it able to be repaired by the men on board. Thresher then returned to Portsmouth in 1962, where, after a brief happy cruise, where the families of the sailors were allowed on board, she underwent further maintenance. During this time, Commander Axon was transferred to another ship, despite protests for him to remain with the Thresher. Instead, taking the helm in 1963 was Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey, who, at 36 years old, already had an impressive resume within the naval forces. Following the maintenance work, in April 1963, the Thresher set off on a fast cruise to test her capabilities. There were a total of 129 people on board. Alongside the submarine's crew of 12 officers and 96 enlisted men were a submarine force staff officer, three officers, and 13 civilian employees from the Portsmouth Yard. They also had a specialist from the Naval Ordnance Laboratory and three civilian factory representatives on the submarine. The Thresher was accompanied by the USS Skylark, a rescue ship designed to be able to save individuals from submarines. She had a crew of specialist divers on board and a special rescue chamber that could be lowered into the water. 
only able to communicate with each other via an underwater telephone. On the 10th of April, Commander Harvey let the USS Skylark know that the Thresher would be undertaking a dive to test depth, the maximum depth that the Thresher could reach. The submarine started her dive at 7.47 a.m., and over time would periodically send messages to the Skylark reporting on the progress that had been made. All seemed to be going well until 9.12 a.m., when messages from the Thresher started to become harder to understand and more concerning for the Skylark's crew. At 9.14 a.m., the Thresher stopped responding, but then, three minutes later, when the final garbled message came through, the only discernible words were, Test depth. Soon after, the captain of the Skylark heard something that sounded like a massive creaking, almost like a ship collapsing in on itself. The Skylark then sent down grenades as an alert to tell the Thresher to start to surface, which was when they began getting in contact with crews stationed on land to let them know of the situation. Helicopters, planes, and other ships were sent out to try to find the Thresher, but over 24 hours later, there was still no sign of the submarine. The Navy then began informing families of those on board that the submarine was missing, not wanting to give up hope that it would be found, perhaps after suffering a communications malfunction. But that's not what happened in the end. A car and a scrapped submarine were dropped around the area that the Thresher descended, in order to access how the currents moved in that area. This then allowed the rescue operation to recover some debris. A manned submersible vessel known as Trieste II was then brought in, one of the only things in the U.S. Navy that could reach the same depths as the Thresher, 8,400 feet down. On June 27th, the Trieste was able to find the main debris site of the Thresher, along with a twisted pipe with the words 593 boat inscribed on it confirming it had indeed found the submarine. Further dives would be undertaken in the following years in order to gain more debris and try to figure out what exactly had happened to the USS Thresher. An extensive inquiry was carried out, numbering over 1,700 pages. Although they couldn't confirm for sure, the devastating tragedy was likely due to a flooding casualty in the engine room. When the U.S. Navy builds submarines, they make sure they can handle pressure up to one and a half times their intended test depth. Determining the collapse depth involves a combination of mathematical calculations and model tests. So it was logical to assume that the Thresher's collapse depth was around 1,950 feet. However, something tragic happened to the Thresher. The series of events that unfolded caused it to go deeper by about 600 feet in just five dreadful minutes, going from its test depth to the point of collapse. It was a critical and devastating turn of events. The catastrophic end of the USS Thresher led the US to delay the construction of any further nuclear submarines. They also expanded their search and rescue program for deep sea operations with the launch of the DSSP program. And although it's not the only nuclear submarine to have been lost at sea, the USS Thresher, with 129 lives lost, remains the worst nuclear submarine disaster in history. 2. USS Scorpion The USS Scorpion, SSN-589, was a nuclear-powered submarine of the United States Navy. It was part of the Skipjack class of submarines and was commissioned on July 29, 1960. The Scorpion was primarily designed for anti-submarine warfare and intelligence-gathering missions. Tragically, on May 22, 1968, the USS Scorpion went missing while on a deployment in the Atlantic Ocean. And it wasn't until October 31st of that same year that the wreckage was discovered. It was believed to have been lost with all 99 hands on board. The USS Scorpion was on a classified mission in the Atlantic Ocean at the time of its disappearance. But later declassification of information revealed that the submarine was given orders to observe a nearby Soviet flotilla on the 20th of May. A massive search operation was then launched to locate the submarine and determine its fate. And when the wreckage was eventually found, it was located about 400 miles southwest of the Azores, at a depth of around 10,000 feet. The initial investigation into the sinking of the USS Scorpion revealed some evidence that pointed toward a possible internal torpedo explosion as the cause of the disaster. The condition of the wreckage indicated damage consistent with an explosion originating from within the submarine. However, the specific reasons for the explosion and subsequent sinking of the USS Scorpion have never been definitively figured out. 
The most relied upon explanation, though, came from an inquiry in 1993 that suggested that uncontrolled flooding could have caused an explosion on board. But even then, this theory is vague. As a result, the exact sequence of events leading to the tragedy remains a matter of speculation and has given rise to various theories over the years. Some hypotheses suggest mechanical failure, malfunctioning torpedoes, or even external factors such as a collision with a Soviet submarine. It's either one of those explanations, or the flotilla the Scorpion was spying on managed to take her out. The loss of the USS Scorpion was a significant event that prompted a re-evaluation of submarine safety and operational procedures within the US Navy. It led to improvements in submarine design, enhanced emergency systems, and refined protocols for submarine operations. And despite ongoing investigations, the full details surrounding the disaster on the USS Scorpion may never be definitively known. The incident also continues to be a subject of interest and study within naval circles and among historians. With the US Navy denying any further inquests and forbidding anyone from being able to dive down to the wreck, it seems like the truth behind the USS Scorpion's demise is still a closely guarded secret. What do you think truly happened to the USS Scorpion? Let us know in the comments down below, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. 1. The Kursk The Kursk, also known as K-141, was a Russian Oscar II-class submarine, a nuclear-powered vessel specifically designed to neutralize large enemy ships, especially aircraft carriers. These large submarines measured 508 feet in length with a beam of almost 60 feet, and in terms of displacement, they weighed a staggering 19,400 tons, twice as much as a destroyer. To match the capabilities of American nuclear-powered carriers, the Soviet Oscar II submarines were equipped with two OK-650 nuclear reactors. Working together, these reactors generated an impressive 97,990 horsepower supplying the necessary capabilities for the submarine's operations at sea and allowing it to reach speeds of up to 33 knots. Each submarine had a hefty arsenal of 24 P-700 granite missiles, and they were as big as small planes, measuring a whopping 33 feet in length and weighing a hefty 15,400 pounds each. And these missiles could pack a serious punch. The Kursk and the subs like it had two options when it came to warheads. One was a 1,653-pound, conventional high-explosive warhead, which was more than enough to deal some major damage to an aircraft carrier. The other option was a 500-kiloton warhead. Just one hit from this warhead would completely vaporize an aircraft carrier. In 1994, the Kursk submarine was finished and joined the Russian Northern Fleet. Then, on August 15, 2000, the Kursk found itself in the midst of a significant fleet exercise. This exercise included the presence of the aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov and the battlecruiser Piotr Velikiti. The Kursk was loaded up and ready for action. It was armed to the teeth with granite missiles and torpedoes, all set for a simulated attack on the Admiral Kuznetsov. It was a high-stakes exercise, testing the capabilities and readiness of the submarine in a strategic scenario. The Kursk's involvement in this fleet exercise showcased its firepower and its role as a formidable force in naval operations. But little did anyone know at the time the tragedy that would befall the Kursk and its crew just a few days later. At around 11.20 a.m. local time during the exercise, a powerful underwater explosion sent shockwaves through the area. Just two minutes later, an even larger explosion followed, causing significant disruption. These explosions were documented by a Norwegian seismic monitoring station, providing evidence of their impact. According to one Russian account, the initial explosion was so intense that it shook the 28,000-ton battlecruiser Piat Velikiti. The Kursk submarine, already struck by these devastating explosions, soon found itself sinking in 354 feet of water at a steep 20-degree angle. The cause of the disaster was later determined by a Russian Navy Board of Inquiry. It was discovered that one of the submarine's Type 6576A super heavyweight torpedoes had detonated resulting in a large tear in the forward bow area near the torpedo compartment. The explosion was likely triggered by a flawed weld that failed to maintain the integrity of the hydrogen peroxide fuel chamber. 
Sinking of the Kursk didn't immediately claim the lives of all 118 crew members on board. There were survivors, as indicated by a note left by Lieutenant Captain Dmitry Koselenikov, an officer on the ship. The note, written two hours after the second explosion, documented the existence of 23 survivors. Desperate attempts were then made to rescue the remaining crew members, as British and Norwegian rescue teams were quickly mobilized to assist in the operation. However, despite these efforts, the Russian government was unable to reach the survivors in time to save them. The wreckage of the Kursk submarine was eventually recovered in 2001, and afterward, it was transported back to the Russian Navy submarine shipyards at Roslyakovo. The tragedy of the Kursk went on to inspire a movie of the same name, starring Colin Firth, that was released in 2018. Which one of these dangerous submarines would you have liked to see in person? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel.